When you look at the slides from 2017, all the goals that we have discussed, which would be worthwhile to do, have been achieved in the meantime. And so in that sense, I think we now have a little bit on, on physics, and then we, we show how everything that we learned the last two or three lectures are combined to implement Shore, and not just talk about how to do it Shore, but how to actually do it. So the first thing is, well, how do you do single qubit gates? How do you do two qubit gates? How can you combine them? Is there something you need to be aware of? To then have what Eduardo called this universal gate set. And for us, as you will see, there are different interactions that you can do. I will focus on particular gates. There are actually, as much as you can learn in atom physics, you can have XX interaction, XZ interaction, and so on. So there's many, many ways that allow you to implement a universal gate set. And usually, I would like to talk about what are error rates and so on, but that's what I usually would do in a completely separate section, which is now a characterization of gates. So you would learn about tomography, state tomography, process tomography, randomized benchmarking, and so on. We hardly have any time to do that, so I'll skip that. Uh, but yeah, a, a very little glimpse there will be. So a reminder from yesterday, usually we start with the initialization. This was something we covered yesterday, and the readout, and it's also something we covered yesterday. Once we have completed this part, in principle, we can do arbitrary quantum computing. So a reminder again, the poor man's version of an ion, and you know that it's a simplified version now, but essentially we deal with three levels. We have a ground state, we have a metastable excited state, and we have another excited state. This is what we will call a qubit with one second lifetime, that's, that's more than enough time to store information, manipulate it. But we also have this other state where if we scatter photons on this transition, if the electron is in a ground state, we pump it up, scatters down, pump it up, scatters down. This one is bright, and if a computer science guy might call it one. Um, if it's in the top state, then it doesn't couple at all, it remains dark, you could call it zero. For the people which are more familiar with simulations, they might call it spin up, spin down. That's all just a language thing. Um, at the end of the day, it's all the same. And we can have strings of ions which we would then read out on a camera. Now for the physics part, remember the ion confinement, the size of the wave packet is on the order of 5 to 10 nanometers. And that's really, really small compared to the wavelength. So if you think about your Hamiltonian, this e to the i k x, so k is the wavelength, the x is the size of the wave package. So that number is really, really small, 10 to minus 2, 10 to minus 3. And that's why you can make this Taylor expansion so you know I really only interact with, let's say, excitation um, with like just a carrier without changing the, the, the vibration of the ion or change like adding or removing one phonon, but not something super complex. So that makes the math easy. The other aspect which is very important for the experimentalists in the room, the typical ion distance is a couple of micron. So whether that's now three, four, or five, but it's... Ah, this time. Now, now it's on. <laughs> um, so that's three, four, five micron. And at the same time, we have this light that we need to manipulate the ion string. It's on the order of 700 nanometers for different ion species. It might be 1,500. It might be 670 if you like strontium. Um, who knows? <laughs> but then the wavelength is shorter than the distance of the ions. And that means roughly you can focus down a beam to the size of its wavelength, more or less. That means you can really have a laser beam which really only interacts with one ion at a time. And you have all, to keep all of those parameters in mind when Eduardo said, just do single qubit control. It means you need to know what's the size of my wave package for manipulation reasons. You need to know what's the ion distance so you can send the beam on one ion and not on the next one, and so on. But at least for us, with ions as a platform, everything nicely aligns. So a detour, again, something you probably had in what you called it first year or so, optics. Um, a beam is never just a line. I mean, we like to draw it, a laser beam as a line, but at the end of the day, if you really want to focus it down, it's Gaussian optics. So you have to keep in mind what's my waist, uh, what's my really length, uh, what's my numerical aperture, which is essentially how much does the beam widen up. If you have a nice collimated beam, okay, yes, the really length is long, but then the focus is also really bad. What we want to do is we want to focus down the beam a lot, 
And that means, um, essentially, sorry, um, how far can you drop it? Like, how much can you make it small? And here you have these array rings because it's 2D for those heads, like a Fourier transform in the plane. That's just a prefactor. You have the wavelength, which is, in our case, 700 nanometer. So you see already, wait, we have 700 nanometers times 1.2. It's essentially already on the order of one micron. And now you'd have to say, what's this numerical aperture? That's like the, the room angle that my lens can cover. A good lens, typically, a good lens, like a cheap one, if we say we take something from second hand from a microscope, would be order two, order three, maybe order four. So you see a typical spot size is actually closer to two micron and not the 700 nanometers. But it's still good enough because it's still four micron iron distance and you can make that work with a reasonably good lens. If you are willing to invest more, Photon Gear and other companies have really, really nice lenses. Then we talk about an A of about 0.6. Um, then you come into an interesting regime, but then these lens cost 30, 40 K. Um, other thing, as we address these ions, yeah, we, we talked about the typical numbers. One tricky part that we didn't talk about, which is again experimental details, but the lecture was meant to be a little bit down the rabbit hole. So you have your laser beam and you focus it onto the ions. One of the problems is like, what's the quality of your viewport? Is it really nicely flat or is it likely bumpy? Which it can be because you have this fused silica which you somehow welded into a metal ring to build your vacuum chamber. Um, what are scratch stick parameters, which means is the, are there scratches um, in the surface? They all have an effect on how well, yeah? Can I make a naive question? Sure. A window, a window in the vacuum chamber. So it's like, uh, we can quickly, it's, it's just you have a vacuum chamber, usually it has holes with threads, and if you want to make sure that you have a good vacuum, you have to close those holes. So it's usually the, the viewport or the window is a piece of glass with a metal ring around, and this one gets just screwed onto the vacuum chamber. And because it's, it's modular, now you can choose, uh, do I want to have a special coating on the glass so that it's highly transparent for specific wavelength? Um, you can make sure that, uh, for instance, the size of the viewport, you, the quality of the window, all of that can be adjusted. So I should maybe add slides on that. Um, then mounting of these windows is partially a pain in the neck. Um, like, are there some tilts? If you induce pressure, does the pressure, for instance, induce birefringence? Um, and this can all be due to bending. That can be screws. That can be the mounting of the window and so on. All of those things need to be taken into account. Um, and it took us almost like half a year to a year recently to find a good supplier again for really, really high quality windows. But they now, it's like they have a lead time of one year. So if you want to start an experiment, you really have to say, can I somehow order something earlier because I need to wait almost for a year just for these windows to arrive, um, which, which is a little bit of a pain in the neck. Yeah. Then one question is, okay, now, now I have a laser beam on my iron, but there's one also very, very naive question. It's like, how do you switch laser beams on and off, and how do you do that really quickly? Because I, I have to admit, I asked at my students in, in one lecture, and they were thinking, well, I just have a mechanical shutter, and I just use that one. And I was like, yeah, on paper that works, but now imagine you want to have, let's do a rule of thumb, someone who's, who's, who's good with rule of thumb math. Beam diameter is roughly a millimeter, and we want to switch the light on and off with mechanical shutter, with like pulse length of a microsecond. And then you immediately notice, okay, the millimeter is 10 to minus three, but I have to switch it off in a microsecond, so I need to move my shutter, yeah, with a speed of 10 to minus three divided by 10 to minus six, so it needs to move at roughly a kilometer per second. <laughs> That's really, really hard for a mechanical shutter. <laughs> so no, mechanical doesn't work. We have to use something else. Um, and so what you can see here, it's called an acousto-optic modulator. It's really simple. What you do is you take a piece of crystal. Essentially, you glue a, a, a speaker onto the crystal. You, you, the speaker is inducing, you, you operate it at megahertz. 
that induces a pressure that gives you a mechanical, let's say, a, a, um, a traveling wave with a changing index of refraction in your crystal. And this grating then results in terms of like you have a laser beam which comes in, and then it can, on this grating, be reflected. And the cool thing now is if I ask you, well, how swiftly can you switch on and off RF? Because that's the only thing you really care about. RF switching on and off in a microsecond is trivial. Like any FPGA, DDS, Malcroni, an RF switch from, from, uh, from, from uh, mini circuits. You can just apply a TTL bias and switches it off easily on those time scales. Um, one little detail that's easy to miss. Yes, you can switch on and off the RF very quickly, but the, the, the sound wave in the crystal is actually slower. So what's, again, solid state people, what's the rule of thumb number for speed of sound in a crystal? Where are the experimentalists in the room? Now no one wants to raise his hand. <laughs> <laughs> again, rule of thumb, couple of kilometers per second is the speed of sound in a crystal. If your beam here has a width of a millimeter, there's a typical wavelength, so like even if you switch it off, you will see a tail of switching on and off that laser beam, which is on the order of, let's say, typically less than a micron. But it's not that you can make a real nice square bias, because there is always this, the wave coming and going, which you never ever should underestimate for these experiments, because this will partially limit the performance that you can achieve. Because the square bias in RF is not going to be a square bias on your laser. But the neat thing here, the other thing for you to notice, so like you see, your laser beam comes in, it gets shifted, so I can move it around, and I can switch it on and off. And what you might also notice, there is something like K vector sensor on, which means now I can also control the frequency of the laser, because it's essentially you take or remove a phonon in terms of energy from or to the laser beam. Now suddenly we have tons of levels of control. We can change the direction. We can change the frequency. The amount of RF that I apply tells me, well, how much do I actually scatter? If I make it very weak, little gets scattered. If I make it strong, lots get scattered. And because I control everything with RF, I can actually also change the phase of the laser because I can change the phase of the RF that I apply on the transducer. And it's really, really nice for, for us in the lab because it means I, I stabilize the laser once, and if I want to change the phase of the, of the laser, I don't have to change the phase of the entire laser. I just change the phase of a little bit of RF. And that's way, way easier to do. And so now I have suddenly full control of my laser beam, and I can move it around, which I can actually considerably use to, to move the beam onto ions. So the first thing you should know, that's what we call a single pass AOM. So the AOM is used here. You apply, uh, for instance, with some voltage. Uh, you go to a voltage control oscillator. You get the RF out. And then depending on what you do, you can move the beam, switch it on, off, all of that. Um, one thing to keep in mind, when you switch it off, you switch off the RF, how well does it actually switch off? Because that determines your remaining error rates. A rule of thumb, again, is you usually, if you switch off the RF, it's good to about minus 30 dB level, so by like three orders of magnitude, it's weaker. But depending on how sensitive your experiment is, it's like you could say, well, three orders of magnitude, but you want to have error rates which are notably below 1%. So that's not good enough. And another thing you might notice is, but if I change my frequency, my beam position changes. What if I want to change the frequency, but I don't want the position to change? Can I do that? And so that's really trivial and simple. That's something we, for instance, do in, in basic lab courses. It's you make it bounce back and forth. So you have your input laser. It goes onto the AOM. It gets reflected to one side. Now you place a lens there, because the lens makes sure, regardless of what your angle is, at the end, it will always be parallel. You send it onto a mirror, and it would go back. Now I would say, OK, now I have my input beam. OK, I can change the frequency and phase and amplitude. But it goes back the very exact same way. How do I remove my input beam from my output beam? 
And that's why you see here a lambda over four plate. What you do is it goes in, you first turn it from, say, horizontal to uh, po uh, sigma polarized, gets onto the mirror, comes back again, goes through the wave plate again, it goes from horizontal to vertical. If I now combine that with a polarizing beam cube, suddenly I have my output port. And now I have the neat feature because I use the lenses and everything, regardless of how much I change my k vector, afterwards it's always parallel and it goes back the very same way. So now I can change amplitude, frequency, and phase without changing the direction. And there's another th neat thing. I just hooked up two switches. So if I want to switch off the light notably better with this system, I suddenly get 60 dB suppression. So also the switching off of light is notably better with a double bus. And the, change, the direction doesn't change. So how, how can I use that? What, what, it's like now we know how to switch on light and on and off. How could I get the laser beam onto an iron now? One thing that we used in the early days is, is essentially think about the prism. You have white light going in, you get your rainbow out, you get a rainbow out because the index of refraction is slightly different for different wavelengths. Now imagine, well, rather than having slightly different index of refraction for different wavelengths, I just have one frequency, so I, I, I won't get the rainbow out. But if you think about uh, there are crystals uh, where the index of refraction changes with voltage. If I now send such a laser beam through this crystal and I change the vortex, then the index of refraction changes, and because the index of refraction changes, also the angle will change. This can be used as we did it here in the old configuration. You have your 729 light, you use an EOD, you apply a voltage, and depending on the voltage, the angle changes. And now we can nicely send it onto the ion. EOD works really, really well, simple, easy. Couple of disadvantages, you have to charge this crystal. It's a capacity, it means it's slow. It's, it's, whenever you work with an EOM and so on, you usually always, you had to apply 100 volts and more to get some at least partial effect on your crystal. So, so it's not just that you need to apply voltage, but you need to apply voltage and current to make it fast. And typical yeah, speeds that we managed to achieve were on the order of 10 microseconds, which is a disadvantage if you, someone tells you, look, I can make really short pulses, but if I want to do a short pulse on the first qubit and on the second, on the third, if the waiting time to move the beam from one ion to the other is longer than the gate, then in terms of efficiency, this is something you want to fix as fast as possible. And the other thing is with the EOD, well, because you, you charge a capacity, well, it never really settles. It's like you get, say, 90% of, of it settled, but yeah, uh, there will always be a little bit more charging of the capacity, which is the EOD, and so you have to deal with that, and because it's still charging, and because we're still changing the index of refraction, the face of your laser will also slightly change. And all of that tells you it's, it's a good starting point. It's easy and cheap. It's like a crystal. You apply a high voltage amplifier onto some DC voltage and you can move your beam around. On the long run, it has a couple of challenges that you wouldn't want to have. So what you could do now is you could use just the AOM itself that we talked about. Works the same way. It changes the direction of your beam. But the drawback is now, okay, it works. Here, for instance, I scan the frequency, and you can see how we nicely align, or like, like excitation on each and every ion. You see an envelope. The envelope is also clear. I mean, the, the AOM is not super efficient for all frequencies. So there is a certain envelope on how efficiently it works for certain frequencies. Um, but again, you can do some nice single ion addressing. One big problem is, well, now you the laser frequency changes with position. You cannot really use that approach if you want to remain resonant, unless you try to compensate for it in the background, but then the, the entire control system becomes a pain in the neck. So there is another way uh, on how to do it. You could say, hmm, wh why do I have to limit myself to a single transducer, like to a single speaker on a crystal? What you could do is you could say, I have here my ions, I could have some light which goes into what's a multi-channel aim. So I have like a piece of crystal, I have a fat beam which just goes into this crystal, and at the top, one transducer per ion. 
And I can say, if I want to have light on the first ion, I switch on the first RF. If I want to have light on the second ion, I switch on the second RF. Can be any configurations of those. That works also really nice and well. That's, for instance, used in, in Duke, in Maryland, and a couple of other labs. One drawback of that approach, as good as it works, now you really need to like electronics. Because first and foremost, you now have to start to control RF for each and every single ion. So if we, we, we talked about it in terms of control electronics per ion, the system becomes more expensive. Another drawback, which, which people figured out very, very early, I mean, we're talking about speakers. Speakers being glued onto a crystal. If you have the speaker glued onto a crystal and you have them at a distance of a couple of millimeters, actually, there is RF crosstalk between each speaker, but there is also mechanical crosstalk, whereas like the, the traveling wave is not just in one center, but also in the others. So you can build electronics where you essentially have to say, if I switch on the second speaker, I have to switch on the first and the third also with notably weaker signal with the right phase. So I get destructive interference in these ports, but I get constructive interference in the center port. The control overhead is a little bit of a pain in the neck. And another issue at that point, as, as, as good as it works for, for Chung Sang and, and Chris and Nobot, um, the transducers usually, as you get them, they are made equidistant. So you, let's say you have a transducer one, mic, uh, one, one millimeter, and every four millimeters you have one. But the ions are not equidistant. If you think about the harmonic oscillator, and you have your ions there, the, the center ones are notably closer to each other than the outer ones. So again, you have to figure out ways of how to compensate for that, or you get the custom AOM. But the very moment you get a custom AOM for your ions, it only works for a very specific ion number because the spread and everything also depends on your ion number. So it's in terms of versatility, that's also not so great. But it works, yeah? Madam <laughs> codes. I can hear you, no one else can hear you. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Uh, hello. Yeah, so, well, when you have, uh, well, when you have more ions, I think that uh, your, uh, your minimum distance, it decreases, right? Yeah. And there is like, like one limit. I think there is like a, yeah, anyway, but, but like, is there also any problem with uh, like, uh, well, because I was thinking that you're trying to get your laser to just one ion. Yeah. But then, if you have more ions, is um, um, well, it becomes really, really hard, right? And uh, no, no, it's, it's not that bad, right? Like, like, uh, like is the there any problem, such as like, uh, well, when they become too close, maybe yeah, you yeah. have a. So, so as I said, the spot size is on the order of one, two micron. So you need to choose the trap frequency in such a way that the ions are notably farther away than this one or two micron. Okay. But as long as you do that, the rest is easy. I see, it's like I see. the rough alignment is all done by hand. Because if you have sufficient uh, lenses and magnification, actually you just have a normal uh, mirror mount and you just align everything by hand. Okay. And also, like, uh, well, if you want everything to, to move, because, uh, well, there is one, uh, like, uh, well, well in, uh, in one of the directions, it can move, right? And, yeah. Uh, yeah, for example, if you have everything. In this, uh, in this briefing mode, for example, yeah. like a... Ah, yeah. but the, the mode, the excitation of this motion is, is on the order of nanometers. So ah, like okay, you okay. can excite okay. it, but at the camera and for the everything, it stays static. You I don't see, even see. see that. Okay. It's, it's, not, it's like on the camera, that's on purpose exaggerated to give you an effect. But if you would do it in, in the lab without exaggeration, no. Nah. Other questions? Okay. Um, last part, a method that we currently use and prefer, is you can also use two AOMs, but you cross them. What you essentially do is you have one AOM which shoots the beam up, and then you have another AOM which shoots it down again. Together, the frequency shift is zero, because you do plus one F and minus one F. 
but you still have the full control. You can change the face, you can change the position, and so on. That's actually an old idea and was used in Bola in 2008. Um, for whatever reason, no one really seemed to have it on the radar, and I'd say these days it's really highly well regarded, because it's just simple. Everyone can set it up. It costs you hardly anything, and it allows you to get really, really far. So you have your first AOM, your second AOM, a couple of lenses. You can send the laser now onto an ion, but what happens is now here in this axis, these would be the ions, but when you look on, on a camera, for instance, what these spots are, well, you have one problem. It's like because you have higher order modes from your AM, and so the first and second and third order can give you something with the first and the second and third order of the other AOM, but at least in the center, everything is fine. So here, there would be the zeroth order. This one you don't want to have. These are just other beams. And that's where the magic happens. Here is where I can move the beam around as much as I want. And there are detuned beams, but they are usually far away. So if you set up everything properly, they don't really interfere and hurt you in your experiments. And that gives you a feeling how far we can push that. So here you see a register of, I think if I remember correctly, 54 ions. And we can easily move the beam from the left to the right, which is notably better than what we managed to do with the single pass area where we managed to get to about 20. Um, yeah, and that's what we are using these days. Here you can see, just as an example, if you drive Rabi flops on each ion, you care about what's the ratio of my, the, the ion that I want to hit and how much stray light do I have on the neighboring ion. We usually define that in terms of the ratio of these Rabi frequencies. Ideally, the ratio, the crosstalk, should be zero. Well, the, the zero doesn't really exist. Um, in our case, what we have on average is a crosstalk of 1%. This was a good number around 2005 if we were working with three, four ions. Now it's a reasonable number if we work with 50 ions. And if you like, are in the right spots on the outside and so on, we can make the crosstalk smaller. And again, if Eduardo would step in now, there are a couple of techniques where you can do uh, corrections for this undesired coupling. So we can essentially square all of these crosstalk parameters to get to levels which are notably below 1%, and that helps us in for, for high fidelity operations. Good, so that was the stuff from there. Big advantage, no frequency shift. Uh, there are a couple of undesired spots, but they are off resonant and far away. Um, one problem under quotation marks is you have to have a lot of power because now you use two AOMs, so that's that. But the beam quality remains really, really good because you always only just have one beam. You don't have a block where you cut out some light. It's really a collimated, nice beam for all the optics. Um, you need to choose the frequencies carefully. And now we are actually almost where the physics, like the theory, can start. Because now we know how to load an ion. We know how to, send the, to switch on and make laser pulses. And we also know how to move the beam onto different ions. And so usually what you would learn is like, give me arbitrary single com or operations and give me a C0. And if you have those together, you have a universal gate set. That was, was what Eduardo was telling you. What you have to live with is that most of the time the experimentalists tell you we don't have a native C0. We have different interactions, but you have to rewrite them to do what you want to do. We'll talk a little bit about MS gate, local operations, and so on, um, to give you a feeling how we do this universal gate set. So first and foremost, again, we have an ion, we have the motion, we have the sidebands. Um, you can couple them, that's just a repetition from yesterday. The core part now is, um, if we do that on resonance, you just get your normal Rabi flops. And we have seen yesterday we can do Rabi flops on the carrier, we can do Rabi flops on, on sidebands and so on, there's nothing special. You can go through all the math. It's just if you are on resonance, you get some nice Rabi flops, if you're detuned, the amplitude goes down, the frequency goes up. All of that is very well known to you. And we can also see that, for instance, in the lab, or you just do the math. And here is, like again, an important formula for us in the lab, because when you drive Rabi flops, you need to be able to recognize these patterns immediately. If you see, OK, frequency is nice, but it doesn't go up to 1, then you have to distinguish, does it go up to one, but does it go down to zero? If it's not going up to one, but it goes to zero, it's a strong indication that you are detuned. 
Does it go up to one, but then it starts to level off, then it's a figure for defacing and so on. This is something we would do in the, in the error and decoherence section, but we don't have time for that. So what we care about now is single qubit, arbitrary single qubit operations. It's really easy. You move your beam onto the ion that you want to have, and then you just switch on the resonant laser. And depending on how long you switch on that laser, that's how much excitation you get. You can make nice rubby flops. And it, unlike the photon guys, we don't have to turn in the wave plates. It's just for us, it's like making an RF pulse longer or shorter. And the other thing which is nice, because everything is RF controlled, as we talked about yesterday with the, the swing, is like just the RF defines, do I, for instance, go up to the top? And then the next pulse can have a different phase, a different phase on the RF. And the relative phase of the first pulse to the second pulse then defines, is it an X or a sigma X or a sigma Y pulse, or minus sigma X or minus sigma Y. We can also do off-resonant beams. So that's something, uh, also we can do that collective. We can also have a broad beam which illuminates all ions. That's just a neat feature if you want to run clocks, for instance. Um, and one cool thing with the AOMs, with the crossed AOMs, what happens if you apply two frequencies at the same time? And that works. You can just apply two RF, you get two spots, and you can get any two spots in your register. And that means we can do parallel operations on, on different ions. And so that here, you can see, for instance, we had four ions. Um, we were doing gate operations on the first and the fourth and we can actually change the phase and the amplitude and everything of these individual beams parallel. So you can do parallel computing in addition with this approach. It would also work with the multi-transducer AOM. It wouldn't work with the EOD because the EOD only ever shifts one beam. And it also hardly works with, well, it works partially with the single AOD, but that's not resonant anyway, so you can't use it for any of the, of the coherent interaction. And just to complete the toolbox, obviously you can also be far detuned, which is a stark shift, and then you can induce, if you want, to localized phase shifts. It's the same thing that you actually use for neutral atoms if you want to build dipole traps. It's the same underlying physics, far detuned, lots of power, you get the phase shift. Good. Um, all of that works. Um, we just skipped the underlying physics for that. Now, let's do an entangling gate, because single qubit gates were easy. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Because when we were dealing with like an active resonance, you usually have to, you only have X and Y. You usually have to apply a Hadamard gate and then do your rotation and come back. So what we do is, also Hadamard is, is a nasty one because it's there, depending on how much mass people did. Often, when you say Hadamard, people t talk about getting a qubit from the ground state into the equator. And what I can do is I can make a resonant beam, which I stop after getting to the top just halfway through. Or the mathematical Hadamard actually has a rotation angle which is not in the equator, but under these 45 degrees. That's why two times Hadamard is, is the identity. Whereas two times uh, pi over two pi is actually the pi pi. Um, we prefer just for tune-up capabilities to do all resonant interactions, so that means uh, we call it any sigma phi, so any combination of sigma x plus sigma y. Uh, we can do separately sigma z if we want to, uh, but if you want to have rotation axes which are not in the equatorial plane, which means they are not, not resonant, that's usually a pain in the neck for the tune-up. But you can always decompose it in essentially two, three local operations. Now an entangling gate. Um, historically, there would be a Sirach Solar. I threw it out because we don't have much time. Uh, we'll, we'll do another gate, which is probably the, uh, uh, like heavily used in the ion trap community, which is called the mermer interaction. What I'll do before we go through the math, may, maybe some of you like the math, but let's do a detour, harmonic oscillator again. So what happens if I have an harmonic oscillator and I drive it off resonantly? So it's in the ground state, something connects, I drive it off resonantly, what happens in terms of amplitude? Again, physics, one, two, three, something like that. Okay. 
¿Sí? No, well, we don't have any damping. We just say, assume it's a perfect harmonic oscillator, perfect drive, everything is nice. It's just off resonance, what happens? Again? The amplitude gradually goes down. Well, first it has to go up because we drive yeah. it. So what, what happens is your pendulum, it, is, it starts to shake more and more and more, and then it becomes less and less and less again, and then it starts to shake again. So this amplitude over time, that's actually one over the detuning is how much you're excited and when it stops again. This is something we know very, very well from a normal classical pendulum. We can use the same trick on ions. The ions are in this potential. What I can do is, can I drive, can I sh shake these ions a little bit off resonant? What would happen is, now my ions are sitting there, they start to shake, and then after one of the detuning from this motion, they should stop again. And they're like, okay, so what did that help? Well, now, for a brief period of time, I started in the ground state, well initialized, and now suddenly my motion couples to the electronic state. That's why it's, it's excited and the motion state. But at the end of the interaction, my motion completely drops out again because after one of the detuning, the motion is in its ground state again. And if you now choose the circle in phase space properly, now you can build entangling gate operations. And the cool thing is now, again, just starting from classical pendulums, whether I drive my pendulum off resonantly and you get to the, ne to the initial point in phase space, that, that always works. It's like it's always one of the detuning where I end up in phase space. It doesn't matter where I start. And if you think about the ions now, that would mean, hey, wait. Because it doesn't matter where I start in phase space, this gate should, in principle, also work when my cooling wasn't perfect. Because I start and I just go in a circle. Then my, it's like I always perfectly decouple my emotional state. I just end up with changes to my electronic state. And these changes to the electronic state are somehow collective because everything was coupled and mixed via the joint motion. And that's the idea of the Mermoz-Aronson gate. So you have your carrier, you have your sidebands, you are slightly detuned. So you say slightly detuned, what you can think of it is like you do something which is like an, an amplitude modulation of your laser light field. That's how we usually actually even tune up the lasers to make sure that all the powers and everything are correct. And if you wait for this one over the detuning time, then you can make sure that your MS gate is closed. There is a couple of math. Um, Christian Rose wrote papers, uh, Mermaz Ernst wrote the initial ideas. There's lots of stuff from, from Peter Jucevic in his PhD thesis. And, and I'll just skip through that because here is the, the excitation of the motion. You do these circles in phase space and the core part is this big phi. That essentially only depends on the powers. Like the, my, my time is defined by what is my detuning, and the rest is coming from my laser powers. And that's all immediately tells you, okay, that could be very resilient. I don't have to care too much about all the other terms and my n and my eta and so on. It's like, no, no, it always stops after one over the detuning or two over the, like you can do multiples, uh, which we usually do, but it's just a power dependent thing. Yeah, and that's all you care. Like your gate time is some multiple over the detuning, and here you can see it's just the rubber frequency. If you choose the rubber frequency correct, the laser power correct, that's your circle in phase space and you're done. And here, I mean, that's, that's how we usually would draw it. You start, for instance, for two qubits in the ground state, you couple a little bit detuned to the sideband, and you have now a coupling from SS to DD. If you completely ignore all the math, you can think about it like out the proper math, you can think about it like a super block sphere. You start in SS, you have DD at the top, you couple from SS to DD. If you choose the powers correctly, well, you get something like a pi over two bars in, in the super block sphere, and you should end up with something which is 0, 0, plus 1, 1, which is a GHZ state, which is entanglement, so the gate does what it should do. That's something which we tried, it worked really, really well. Here you get a feeling how, how long ago that was, it's already more than 10 years. 
But that worked amazingly well. Here you see theory versus experiment. And the really cool part there is that was for the very first time already 10 years ago that we managed to achieve fidelities which were at the edge of what you need to achieve fault tolerance. So if you look at some of these codes, color code, surface code, and so on, they all say if you have large enough systems, the, the threshold is roughly at the level of yeah, better than 1%. Bef before we used the MS gate, error rates were 2 3%. With that one, for the first time, we managed to get below 1%. That was good. What was cooler was this. Yesterday we heard all about you can polarization gradient cooling, sideband cooling, EID cooling, and so on. Then Gary just said, well, this thing about the phase space where it doesn't matter where I start, so I could in principle be hot. The gate should still work. And that's what we managed to show there. He was using Doppler cooling only. The mean phonon number in the beginning was on the order of about 10. It was not zero or something, it was 10. And the gate only, it's like even then, the gate was better than anything we had before the Mermaserons gate without having Doppler cooling. And you could say now, well, but you can do sideband cooling. Why do you care about not having Doppler cooling? For us, the perspective there was a, an entirely different one. You, you heard we try to cool the register, and then you do computation. And you heard there's always a little bit of RF, and it's like the string slowly gets hot. This gave us the idea to say, okay, now we can really run in principle for really, really long operations because heating of the register as you slowly go from n equals zero to one to three to four to five, it's not really going to impact the performance of our gate operations. Um, so now, just as a last part, the, yeah? So how, how much time are we talking about? A hundred microseconds typically, hundred to 200 microseconds. So the detuning is on the order of 10 kilohertz or so. Uh, but it can be chosen. You don't want to have it notably faster because then you again start to couple to other modes and so on, but it's, it's a rule of thumb. And here, just to show you, because you could say, but, but Eduardo said single qubit gates and C0, show me a C0. And so you can rewrite this XX, here is the Mermaserans interaction. You can rewrite it as a C0 with just adding a few single qubit operations. And so because you can build a C0, and because you have single qubit operations, it makes it's, it's a universal gate set. Good. Um, one nasty, at the same time, great thing. Everything couples with everything, because all joined by the joint motion. Just, just give you a feeling of how we can drive that. We started with two qubits. You can also do it with four. And then we somehow got lost in terms of what couples to what, and we had to think about different ways. So you can really draw, and you have to connect all the qubits. This is interesting, not so much for computing, but it was highly interesting for simulations. Because if you want to have a system where you say everything has to interact with everything else, this is immediately your choice of interaction, because you can have a good uh, multi-qubit, uh, or let's say um, multi-particle interaction with, based on this, on this gate. And you can push that farther and farther. Then you don't want to draw it anymore. Um, it can be used for a couple of things now. And well, how many, how many are you? Speaking? Yeah, we come to that. Yeah. <laughs> it's always these impatient professors. Yes. yes? yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we can really easily generate GHz state. We sent this picture of this super block sphere, and you start from zero zero to one one, and you stop halfway through. So how can you? characterize the GHZ state quickly. Usually, if you write down a density matrix, you have these four pillars. Uh, one way of looking at it is, like, how do you write it down? OK, there's ZZ, XX, YY, and so on. Um, you can write down the expectation values. But if you have to write phases, actually, this is the population. This is something I can see by just looking at the ions. And here, this is what we call parity. This is essentially how much is um, 1, 1, minus 0, 0, and so on. These we can really, really efficiently characterize. You just have to make these measurements. And that's also connected to stabilizer formalism, uh, which Eduardo brought up in terms of error correction. So what you want to do is, now you say like, ah, I just need to know those two numbers. If I have the populations, and if I know the parity, which is, in other words, just the coherence of my system, because if you think about it, I have two populations. There is just one element, the outermost corner, that's the coherence of my system. 
If I note the populations and the coherence, I can immediately write down a fidelity. We can measure that efficiently in the lab. Here you see it with up to eight ions um, and the fidelity over, the, over a number of qubits. And so that it was kind of flattish. And you see how long ago that was. I had a little less gray hair there. Um, but we pushed that farther. So now with Vanya, one of my PhD students, it's now at 24. And so this threshold is you need to be above 50% to know that it's genuine multiparticle entanglement. And this is something we did just last year to show that we can have still constantly growing levels of performance in the system. You can also look at it, at least for the experiments in Innsbruck, over time. So what kind of set state fidelities have you achieved? Here you see 2011, we managed to improve on that in 17, we managed to improve on that in 21, and we're going to promise to, to push and control far larger and larger systems. Is that good? How do others compare? Because you could say, well, but IBM claims we have 400 qubits now. Here you see data across all platforms, the best numbers that you can find in the academic literature. And it's interesting because here you see, okay, certain platforms all started around 2000. And then you see how this control continuously increased. And this is also what I meant yesterday in, in, in the, what's it called, round table, when I said it's like as much as I would like to see something really kicking in, 20 years of data doesn't seem to imply anything really taking off. Everything we see, besides maybe here a little bit, it looks pretty much as if, if, if it's linear. It's good, there is progress. It's not that we hit a wall and we don't know how to proceed, but it's also not that you could say, well, we have 400 qubits. You can always say, but if you tell me you have 400 qubits, make a 400 qubit GHZ state. If you can't do that, uh, what, what is it really good for? Good, and now I'll rush a little bit through a couple of alternatives. I was showing you now how you can control a qubit using laser light. That's not the only way to do it. There are ways where you can, for instance, use Raman qubits. Raman has a couple of advantages. You still have laser light. You can still do the addressing. One challenge that we can't talk about in the amount of time that we have, you really, as I mentioned before, you want to be resonant on your qubit transition. And if you want to have a good coherence time, your laser has to be really, really narrow in line width. Because your laser line width, let's say laser line width is 10 hertz, well, that means you only have 100 milliseconds coherence time. If you want to have more than 100 milliseconds coherence time, your laser has to be on the order of a hertz or less. We achieve that nowadays in the lab, um, but it's, it's there are about maybe 10, 15 labs worldwide, maybe 20, something like that, that conveniently can realize lasers at that level. An alternative is a Raman setup. You just make a beat node between two lasers, you stabilize this beat node, it's really straightforward, and then suddenly it's only the relative phase of the laser that needs to be stabilized. That's really easy, because suddenly it's not the question of the stability of your laser, it's the uh, stability of your RF source. So we'll go through that. Then you could say, well, just throw the laser away entirely. Can't I just couple with microwaves? Yes, this works. This is something that's, for instance, done by, by NIST, it's done by Osprey it's done in Oxford, and a couple of others. And then I just give a teaser, in some sense, to the presentation by Markus, because you could say, but all of that is like 100 microseconds. Can't you do something faster? And Markus can show you some stuff where he doesn't take 100 microseconds, but it's closer to, say, roughly 100 nanoseconds, maybe a little more. But it's like, couple of, like at least two orders of magnitude faster than what we usually would do. And that's something that Markus will talk about. Um, short. Overview, so we had this spin, uh, the, the optical qubit before. Here we had to have this narrow line with laser. For the spin qubit, usually you look at the ground state. Ground state, you have one big advantage immediately. Your T1 time becomes infinite. It's not that you have like a one second lifetime up here, there. It doesn't really make, usually it doesn't make sense to write down any number. And the other thing is, yes, you are a little bit sensitive to magnetic field fluctuations and so on, but yeah. If you, if you do operations there, all the motion and so on gets a lot uh, easier. That's, for instance, something that Mainz is doing. If you ask them, how do you do the readout? Well, it's, you still need this narrow laser that we are using, because what you do is your qubit stays at the bottom here. 
But if you want to distinguish the two states, what you have to do is you transfer that's the spin up or one or whatever you want to call it. You, you shift the population to the D state. Then you have something which is, again, your normal optical qubit, and you can do your usual readout. But at least for all the computing, you stay in the ground state, for instance, using Raman biases. Mainz is doing that. Here you see a typical sequence. They start with Doppler cooling. We've had that before. Then they use optical pumping to get everything, for instance, over here. Then they can do Raman gates for the coherent interaction. Again, not going to go into the details. They shelve it at the end, and their experiment is done. Works really, really well. They have like nowadays entangling, as like entangling operations, read out everything at the same level as we have it. Um, but yeah, what they do in addition, they do shuttling. So here, if you want to make your registers longer and longer, you said, okay, the ions are pushed together. Can I split them apart? What do I do if I have more than 10, 20 ions? What do I run into problems? So mine was realizing right away from the start, can we have segmented traps? With segmented traps, I can take, for instance, a string of 40 ions and split them into 20 plus 20. And then you would define interaction zones where you move whatever ions you want to work with, you put it into this interaction zone. This helps you also to further reduce the crosstalk because now your ions are not four micron away, but they can be half a millimeter away. But you have to live with the entire overhead on how to do shuttling and so on. Um, there are spin-dependent forces. Didi was working on that at NIST already 20 years ago. It works really, really well. You can think about it that way, that again, similar to the Mermer-Sernison uh, Mermer interaction, you just drive this harmonic oscillator and you do that in a convenient way, in such a way that again, after one of the detuning, all the passes in phase space are closed and you only have changes to your electronic state. A um, Couple of minor details that we'll just skip here. Um, one idea that you should know about Raman lasers, okay, Raman lasers is usually two beams. Is there a different way of doing it? And yes, there is. There's an, I would say, nasty one, but it at least works for the Maryland and Duke people. Can you think about what happens in, your, in a spectrum with a pulsed laser? If you have a pulsed laser, then in your spectrum, that actually is like, looks like a comb. If you choose now, the repetition rate correctly, what you can think of is can one tooth with the other tooth just couple this Raman transition? And if you now think about it, but that means, let's say, tooth one and tooth 100 gives you the Raman transition, then tooth two and 102 gives me the Raman transition, and three with 103 gives me the Raman transition. That looks good. And the other thing which is really, really nice about it it means that the entire laser power in my beam is used to all coherently couple in this transition. And you can buy these pulsed lasers like off the shelf. They are used a lot in semiconductor industry. Like here you see the, the coherent, it's called Paladin. It gives you 24 watts of power, which is way more than we usually need. It's like something you shouldn't look at, like with your eye. Um, uh, and this works really, really well. What you have to do is you now have to stabilize the rep rate to really make sure that this Raman transition works. So the underlying idea you can see here, you have one tooth plus the other one, and you just add all of them up to get this desired coupling of your Raman transition. But you do that all from a single laser and it works. The tricky part there is that Coherent, the company, says, well, it was never ever designed and meant to have this reputation, uh, rep frequency really, really well stabilized. So that's where the experimentalists come in. You, you get it, you break the lid, you add a couple of components to make it really, really stable, but it works. Next part, microarrays. Just quickly, you could say, well, if we have the ions and if we have the motion and there are all these side band transitions, um, if I started with Raman and I used the microwave, which is like on the order of say gigahertz to couple this transition, can't I use the microwave directly? Wouldn't that be so much easier? And in principle, all you need to care about is you have your ion at the center, you have an electric field, and in some sense you induce these forces a little left and right. You can do the same thing with your microwave source from the side. If you have, let's say, your wave going up, you see stronger forces on this side compared to the other, or you do it perpendicular, and then you can have stronger coupling. And all of that works. Um, Osprekhaus was doing that when he was in NIST. 
uh, Christoph Wunderlich is doing that, for instance, in Siegen, to think about can we do microwaves to get grids going. So the underlying physics, it's, it's essentially you use these gradients. It works really well. A couple of details again, which we'll skip. Um, but to give you an idea how old this is, the initial ideas on how to do that were covered in 1992. But then again, for technological reasons with microwaves and how do you do antennas and so on, and how do you get them into, micro, uh, into the vacuum chamber, it was easier for us to start working with lasers. And now people are really pushing for microwave because microwave has again one big advantage. So these one hertz lasers, I told you that I have 10, 20, 30 teams that have these lasers worldwide. The Paladin laser, uh, probably every larger semiconductor company has them in their fabrication, so there are thousands of these systems around. If you have microwaves, a uh, microwave source you can buy, buy from Amazon. It's like so much of an established technique that if you say, I want to have something reliable, uh, microwaves I can just get for free almost. So if you build on top of that, you could say then my quantum computers might be very reliable because this supply chain has already been covered. I don't have to build a new prototype each and every time. So here you see a system. Um, this is now a slide, for instance, from Osberg House when he was still working at NIST. You can induce microwaves here. That was the idea of, let's say, this left and right. You have the ions at the center, and you can induce gates. One, one cool thing, as we mentioned, in a ground state, there is no spontaneous emission. It should be temperature insensitive because your wavelength and everything Previously, we said it's, it's a couple of nanometers relative to 700 nanometers. In that case, the mass still more or less holds. Now you'd have to say, but now it's relative to millimeters. And so that's why the coupling to the motion drops out entirely. Um, it should be easy to control. And another thing is, it should also be easy to integrate because you only have to get wires into your trap. Here you see some gates. Typical numbers from 2011 were 76. Obviously, that in those days was a little bit hard because at the same time, Gerhard Kruchmeier was showing 99% gate fidelities and 98 without cooling. Um, and these good gates were then 76%. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to integration, on the long run, this could be a viable way forward. And the numbers have been continuously improved. So now you can also have ions in these traps. You can push them around to really make sure which ion couples to the microwave, in which way do you only couple one ion to the microwave or two ions to the microwave. All of that is, there is lots of progress in that field. Yeah, and the cool thing, at least for the microwave people, is they don't need any lasers. Their point of view is we need a laser only, a little bit for cooling in the beginning, and then once for shelving, but for everything else, they, <coughs> I say, to, to some degree, they get around that. Um, here you see some numbers, um, how well that works. So here at the top, hidden a little bit, the, the newest data is on the level of 96%. Uh, it's still about a factor of 10 worse than what we can get with lysis, but you see that these numbers were constantly improving. And it's not just done in, in Siegen or in, uh, say, it in Hanover, but also NIST is doing it, uh, Chris Ballant at Oxford is doing it, um, Winnie Hensinger and Sussex is doing that. As you push for smaller compact systems with improved control, there are a couple of teams doing that. And here, last parts uh, of this session, it's not just those, it's also China. So Kivan Kim in Tsinghua is doing that. I think Kivan was a postdoc when you were in Inspria. Yeah, so so Kivan was one of our postdocs. I was still a young, innocent PhD student. <laughs> Good that you have a mask on. Um, here you see the setup from Kivan, um, where he also wanted to push for microwaves. And he said, ah, microwaves are really, really well controlled. But rather than trying to push for really good gates, can I make a really, really good long qubit? Like, what, how long can I push coherence time? Because so far we heard coherence time should be on the order of seconds or so. But how far can we really get? So Kivan has his vacuum chamber here. You see the trap on the inside. It's just a typical, slightly segmented pole trap. You have the four blades, but he made a couple of cuts so that, in principle, he can split or move ions around. He can have nice long uh, chains of ions. Here you see about 20 to 30 ions, which he can work with. And he's using, on purpose, the ground state, in that case, in the terbium, which has a splitting of 12 gigahertz. And the terbium has one nice property. You can pick transitions which are first-order magnetic field insensitive. 
which means all the 50 hertz noise that we don't feel, but actually what we can see in the lab because of current floating around in, in the wires, all of that to a large degree won't affect your qubits. And so what he then wanted to do is, let's say, okay, let's start with the terbium, that should be my qubit. Maybe I need barium to recool as I make really, really long, nice sequences because I have heating in my trap. We heard that before, if I want to push beyond seconds, suddenly I get phonon numbers. Um, maybe I have to have another ion there just to recool. And what happens if I cool this ion because of the Coulomb interaction, if that one is cold, the other one also has to be cold. So it's a coolant ion, your qubit ion. He then switched on the microwave and he tried to push for it. And what you can see here, that's from REMS experiments. That's how much contrast you have. So that would be one, and for whatever reason, he likes to do it on, on a kind of a logarithmic scale. And here it's seconds. It's not microseconds, it's not milliseconds, this is seconds. <laughs> and it goes up to not 10 or 100, but it goes out to 1,000. So he was able to show that they can have coherence times on the order of 5,000 seconds. That's by far the largest number that, as far as I know, has been achieved in any of these quantum computing experiments. Yes, there were no gates. Yes, there was no entangling gates. Details. It's like you focus on one thing and you can show you are among the best worldwide. This number outperforms any other platform. It's like it's better than photons because how, how like, again, if you have, a, let's say, a, a roll of fiber and you ask the photons to bounce around for an hour, no, no, it will be absorbed. It's like, no, no matter how good your telecom fibers are, it won't be floating around for an hour. If you think about uh, superconducting systems, the best coherence time they have achieved are on the order of, say, slower they get towards milliseconds, like one millisecond or so. It's not hours, it's not seconds, it's not minutes, it's not hours. And so if you want to run long computation, coherence time is one of the important things, and here you see why I think the Eintrap platform is really among the very promising uh, platforms. We ha you have seen across all systems, the, like we have managed to entangle up to 24 qubits that no other platform so far could do. And we have coherence times where you now really can say, I start the experiment and I'm coherent by the time I get my coffee and come back into the lab. So and you could say, what are the limits? Which I again, if you are in clocks and so on, what are the limits? One of the initial biggest problems for Kivan was to have a really good microwave source. The normal off-the-shelf, let's call it Amazon, or in his case, potentially Alibaba, uh, microwave source was not good enough, so you had to fix it. There were a couple of magnetic field fluctuations which you had to fix. Um, but yeah, this is currents in the wall. Now the third term, he calls it ion hopping. Essentially, this is really the wiggling of the ions because of the phonon motion. It's not like a big jump, that's just a little bit of wiggling. Then, this one, scattering of lasers. This brings us back to the double bus AOM. Because if I, if I say a double bus is switched off with 60 dB for everything else, usually you don't care. But if I say it's switched off by 60 dB and for one hour not a single photon is allowed to be scattered, then 60 dB is not good enough. So you really have to say, like, do I have to stack double bus AMs to get better suppression of on and off than 60 dB? Microwave, again, you switch off your hour switch, your typical mini circuits hour switch. It's not going to be good enough. On the time scale, when you look here, microwave 5, we are at 10 to 6, 10 to the 7 seconds. The RF needs to be better switched off. But he's just looking at it. Then he comes to background collisions, and at the end, really, because I said, okay, lifetime of the qubit in the ground state, you don't care. But yeah, it's on the order of 10 to the 12 seconds. That's when you then start to see uh, some of the limits. But I mean, the ground state we can't really fix. Collisions with the background we can fix, leakage we can fix, laser switching we can fix, cooling we can partially fix, magnetic field we can fix. So if you think about this, we can, it's like from a technical level, we should be able to get from 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4, 10 to 5, 10 to the 6 with ions, and there is no real limit at the moment. Yeah? Is a collision with a background gas, but which gas? Isn't it in the background chamber? Yeah, yeah, but the zero doesn't exist in experimental physics. So the pressure is low, but it's never zero. It's like typically 10 to minus 11. You saw in the picture here, 
So that's a room temperature setup. Um, if you would hook it up with a cryostat, you can go into extreme vacuum, then you gain another two, three orders of magnitude, if possible. Sure. Inside the chamber, so it's steel vacuum. is like it's just a solid state. Everything moves through a solid slowly. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's, it isn't, uh, that's not the cause of the vacuum. Well, uh, partially. Okay. It's like depending on how clean you made the vacuum chamber or hydrogen penetrating your steel, in that case, it's better to use titanium. It, it, it's better. Um, you can use a cryo that gets rid of everything but helium again. Um, there, there are a couple of things how you can notably improve your vacuum. But yeah, it's like if you do that, then we should end up somewhere here. And I think if you have a qubit which can last for 10 to the 9 seconds, that, that's good. If your coherence time is longer than your PhD, then you have one. <laughs> so, a couple of advantages and with that I'm through my window again. Questions? Yeah. I have one more question. Just, yeah? uh, when you're dealing with very long coherence time, you're already uh, maybe okay. <laughs> okay. Can you listen to me? You switch it on. Okay, I guess you turn it off during the travel time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so when you're dealing with like really long coherence time, there's potential applications for quantum memories. Memory, yeah. yeah. But uh, I've heard sometimes in the lit literature that uh, you want your quantum memory to be optically addressable because yeah. you want to send it to your network and, and, and sometimes even in a bandwidth that is, um, what do you call it, Wavecom, yeah. telecom yeah. Yeah, bandwidth. So uh, have you guys, I, I'm, I'm just asking how what, I'm just ask, first, I'm asking what is optically addressable because I've heard this term, but I, was, I didn't look into it. And if it is, so mm -hmm. it, in principle, it's really cool because in level scheme, you can have the microwave gates at the bottom, but it also has a quarter wall and an octopole transition. So you can use iterbium also for optical qubits and so on. But what you'd also have to question yourself is the photons I can potentially generate, can I make those telecom compatible? This is something that we looked at in Innsbruck. So Marana Martin just finished his PhD and had a defense here about two months ago. And he was checking. So, so you essentially have different kind of like mixing. You have a pump laser and photons from your ion. What kind of laser, like how can I, what kind of wavelengths can I generate? Can I transfer, because the, the, the wavelength of the ion is fixed. There's nothing I can change, but I need to get to telecom. So what can I do? And here you see stuff of Martin, where he said, how can I get to, for instance, the C-band, which is this 1.55 nanometer uh, micron wavelength, how can I get there? And he was checking that for calcium, for barium, for strontium, for ethereum. And you can see ethereum is really nice for some properties, but if you want to somehow mix the wavelength, the only thing you can get out is something between, say, 700 and 600 nanometers. Because it's already so far in the UV. It's far away from telecom to be anywhere good for that. You want to be somewhere up there, and then that's, that's how somehow calcium becomes interesting again. Um, you can go really easily to telecom. I mean, that's something I wanted to cover. We can't cover that anymore. But in, in Innsbruck, we managed to show two quantum computers, a distance of half a kilometer. And we had those create entanglement at a distance. And for one of these setups, they were also to show, uh, able to show you can get a photon out, which would be your, like your network. Then they did a transfer of this photon from 850 nanometers to 1550 nanometers send it into a telecom fiber, which was just a roll of telecom fiber, 50 kilometers long. So, and they could show that there was entanglement between the photon coming out and the ion. So it didn't uh, destroy the state. The state was conserved. Yeah. OK, cool, cool. And, so, and now you can say, what, what would you probably do? And that's, again, ions can talk via the joint motion. So what you probably would do 
And again, the iron people know it's not that trivial and it's, it's actually a bad idea, but yeah. You could say, I, I have one species for my computing. I have another species there to do this conversion and then try to send it towards telecom. And so one thing that people like to do is here, for instance, to, but you have to have similar masses, ethereum with barium. But for barium, you can see you would be at the very edge. So you could say, I have barium and ethereum in one trap. Ethereum would be my good qubit. Barium would be the one that I use for recooling. We heard that from Kivan in Tsinghua. And then I can use the very same barium to go towards the network. And it's not the C band, but it's the O band. But nevertheless, you would have very <coughs> little uh, dispersion for those fibers. And so yeah, you'd have the overhead of working with two species, but in principle, it works. Professor, can you please show the, the, the image of the chain of ions? Uh, my question is about it. A chain or a specific one? No, the, the, the ones of the, the fringes, the bright fringes. Uh, just uh, ah. some slides after or That's before. This one? Yes, that, yeah, this one. Uh, can you give me, please, a uh, um, physical explanation? But because why the the ions next to the border are more spaced ah. than the ions at the center? Okay, so it's Coulomb interaction. Okay, just in the center, there is like it's, it's almost like you're sitting at the bar. Where is it more crowded? In the center or on the edge? Center. Uh, okay. yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> so that you get the center of positive charges just with that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, more bar-related questions, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? At the end of the, the computation, yeah? the process you used to reinitialize your qubits, was that one that you showed us in your first meeting? Yeah. Well, it's the process that we can use for cooling is also the same process that you use for initialization. Oh, OK. It's the same, nothing so it's, changes. It's essentially the same, yeah. OK, thank you. More? I actually have one, but it's, it's, it's just out of curiosity. Uh, you, you see this uh, companies like IBM and Google showing results about qubits and they saying they need more and more and more and more yeah. each and every time. But do you think the ion trap could give a better result that then would say they need now for complex problems? Sure. Do you think this can happen in the it, future? It, it is already now the case. So there is one metric which was developed by IBM, which is called quantum volume. So it's essentially you, you take a couple of ions, also qubits, and you on purpose have to do some, let's say, challenging computation on it, where you try to connect all qubits with all qubits. And the success measure is, for whatever reason they chose it that way, that the number that you communicate, if it works, is um, the number of qubits and the gate depth for that circuit. If both of them are the same, then this number is reported, say like for two qubits and the depth of, of, of two, if you succeed, you take this number of two, and you say two to the power of the success number. That's what you communicate. So if it works for three qubits and the depth of three, then you will say my quantum volume is eight. We say it's, and then my, my exponential slowly start is like seven qubits would be what, 128 or something like that? Uh, yeah, should be. I think that someone has really fast with their phone. I think the, the quantum volume from, also the best quantum volume achieved so far was done by Honeywell, 
And it's uh, like, I think they can have a success. It works for up to 13 ions with a depth of 13. Um, and I think for IBM and others, they are at around eight or nine. So in terms of good control of the entire register, yes, ions so far are leading. But that's what I also mentioned on Monday when I said, if you only care about how many qubits there are, then in particular, you should say, I switch on the light and I create really, really many photons. Yeah, it's yeah. just the control is a little bit limited. Thank you. Uh, if, uh, tell me about the, how many qubits you can have inside your hand. <laughs> 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 this is his idea. This is nice. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you're going to talk about this later on, but uh, I would like to know how you connect uh, the code, like the API, with the gate operations that you implement in the lab. Can you ah, so explain? That's, that's trivial. So it's essentially more or less a, a lookup table. So for the single qubit operations, whatever you use, whether it's Qiskit, Penny Lane, uh, PyTicket, what else do we do? Uh, Quest. Um, that's just a, a normal lookup table between their definition of the gate and our gate. Uh, the tricky one is that most of the people would say, I write the circuit with a C0. So what you do is you decompose the C0 with the local gate set. And then I, Qiskit and others all offer compilers. So for instance, you, you compress you know, like usually any two, three, four local operations. You can always compress it into one or two uh, single look qubit local operations. And, and that's all taken care of in the background by, by all these freely available software development kits. I think from, from our side, if you l think you can look up the details, it's called uh, Qiskit Playground, and there is an AQD backend, and you can just look it up what happens there. But uh, how uh, it is like uh, the connection between the software and the hardware? Like ah, so, well, uh, the, the, the software, all, it, all the software has to figure out is, in our case, um, say you, you tell me make a pi over two pies, or make a hard amount. I make a pi bars is easier. You make, make a pi bars. What, what the software then does, it, there is a database which knows, ah, there is my ion, what's my resonance frequency? So it knows, ah, for making a pi bars, I need to be resonant. So it starts to initialize a frequency source with the right frequency. Then in the database, it says, for a given power, what when you think about the rubber flops, how long does it take me to go from the ground state to the excited state? So it takes the rubber frequency to, to determine then how long does the pulse have to be to make a nice pi pulse. And so it's really just taking the, the math in terms of a pi pulse, it's like going to the top, takes the physics, so there's a frequency, there is a power, there is a phase and so on, turns that into an RF pulse, and that RF pulse then gets triggered. Or like, let's say it gets enclosed with there is initialization and readout, but in the center part, that's what happens. Nice. About the quantum problem here. So, quantum volume. So that, uh, um, 2020, well, it's not the most recent data, but it's good enough. So 2020, the quantum volume was 32 by IBM. And they managed to increase it um, to 128. In the meantime, uh, Honeywell has now a quantum volume of 8,192, which is this 13 by 13. So, so maybe one comment on this. Um, the quantum volume physically makes a little bit of sense, but not too much. It's like having a challenge where you have qubits and connectivity and depth. That was the background and motivation for the quantum volume. You could say, but why do I define it with two to the number? Because it, I just give me the number. Just tell me you can do it with 13 qubits and a depth of 13. That's it. From what I heard, the rumor is uh, marketing from IBM said, well, everyone thinks about Moore's law, so there has to be something which grows exponentially. So we'll just communicate two to that number so that we can claim something grows like at least with a factor of two every year or two. 
Um, so that there is something which grows exponentially and so on. But I hope, it, like, for you, the takeaway message should be it's really this number of qubits you care about. And that's why if, if IBM says we want to increase the quantum volume by a factor of two per year, what they actually are saying is we want to add one qubit per year. And that was partially the concern from yesterday in, in the panel discussion, where if, if you say we want to make the quantum volume a factor of two or three, of, or like the two or four or eight larger per year, what you're actually communicating is we intend to add one, two, three qubits per year. And it's linear. It looks exponential because they defined it to be exponential as yeah. two, two or something. But actually, in terms of, of memory available to people, it's actually, it's really just linear. More questions? <laughs> if it would be a football, likely it would work. Pretty bad with that. Uh, I think that the question is related with the one made earlier, but you show us like the the plot of that uh, the ions and uh, the population, yeah. right? But at the edges of the population, it was like the half of the me of the population in the in the book. The, the ah, when you, the addressing, when yeah. I moved, yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's for us, it's just showing you how far you can, in principle, push the system. What it means on the side is the excitation is weaker. So for the same amount of power, I get less excitation. That's why you need to have this database, which really knows the rubber frequency for each and every ion. So if you say, I want to do something on the left most, then you have to wait longer for the same amount of power to get to the top. Okay. Thanks. But that's, that's all calibrated in the background, that you know how long does a pulse have to be to do a full excitation on the leftmost, on the center, on the rightmost. More questions? Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> when do we close? Ah, <laughs> oh, so you're done? So then, then I would argue, because I always went over time, now I do under time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah then I think we see each other after the lunch break then. After lunch break. Yeah. Good.